Hello, my friends. This is Deepak and Deepak Chopra again, and we are continuing our conversations with uh, extraordinary people and uh, those who've made a difference uh, for themselves and their lives, and also uh, from whom we can learn um, as we struggle through challenges in our lives. So today, my, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Karen Laurie, and you'll hear a little bit about her journey. And uh, uh, first of all, welcome, Karen. Thank you so much, Dee. I'm so happy to be here and I really appreciate you inviting me. Thank you. Okay. So of course, uh, I've known you for several decades uh, now. Uh, I am very inspired by your journey from recovery to health, well-being, uh, self-awareness, spirituality. Uh, can you share for our audience uh, briefly your journey from struggling with addiction to where you are now? And also uh, talk a little bit about your books, but I'll come to that later. Let's talk about the first question. Sure, yeah. So um, I had a little addiction, not a, not a terrible thing, but pretty pretty, tr pretty tragic <laughs> in some ways um, from about when I was maybe 15 or 16 until I was 23. And when I was 23, I decided um, to get sober. I had a spiritual experience and I decided to get sober. So I'm sober now 36 years plus, um, which I love. I love that. And I'm just feel incredibly thankful. And um, it's been through that practice, um, I learned a whole bunch of incredible spiritual principles that have served me. And then I still am learning spiritual things and have grown in so many ways. So there's other things that I have learned. And in the last 12 years, I've let go of addictions like the addiction of sugar, the addiction of um, grains, the addiction of dairy, um, all those things were kind of addictions. And I've let go of the addiction to news and to all of that stuff. And I've now come into a place where I'm in a place of love um and it's it hasn't always been that way i i um i had that addiction feeling i also had um ptsd and anxiety attacks and depression and i was suicidal for a lot of my life i'm no longer have any of those things anymore and i had um chronic pain for a while i had narcolepsy and I've cured the narcolepsy. I've, I don't have any more pain in my body. My everything has changed. My relationships have changed. I, I don't get triggered in a negative way. I get triggered in a positive way, like into more love and into more joy, but um, not in a negative way anymore. And so that's remarkable from the way I was getting triggered where something could throw me off and I'd be in a panic or I'd be dissociated. So I don't have that anymore. I've been practicing for the last 12 years on a very consistent level, being in a state of unconditional love. And so in that process, so many things have healed and I've learned how to heal myself. So from the age of 15 to 23, uh, you were addicted to substance, right? Uh, can you yeah. say what? Yeah, I mean, part of it was, I think probably, a a, a way to try to treat the narcolepsy that I think I got when I was around three when I had a bad concussion. So I was doing things that gave me more energy, usually amphetamine. Um, I did a little bit of cocaine, but not much. It, it was too, it was too intense for me. And then alcohol, I couldn't handle pot. That was too, that was too intense for me. But so mostly it was amphetamine and alcohol. Those were the two that I really um, connected with. But what I found, and if you don't mind me sharing this, is that what I was looking for from those drugs is what I now have from my spirit. And I think that that is one of the things that most people don't realize is that when you fill yourself up with the energy of your spirit, which is that energy of love and bliss and presence and power and joy, things shift so fast. I've gotten so spectacularly healthy but I didn't have that when I was a kid. I was, I was an active gymnast at the time and working out and going to college and all that stuff. And I always felt like I needed something to deal with the traumas that I'd had when I was younger. 
So you were able to overcome what we would call substance addiction, particularly alcohol and a little bit of other stuff. Can you ask that again? I didn't hear it. Now you overcame uh, the addiction to both alcohol and other substances a long time ago, from the age of 15 to 23, which is significant, eight years you struggled. What would you attribute that recovery? And I'll come to now, what, what was that recovery? Uh, was that also a spiritual transformation? You know, there's a couple things. Um, one was definitely had a spiritual awakening, but another one was I was in a community of people that had had a similar experience. And there was a lot of fun. And I remember reading, maybe this was like 25 years ago, so I'm not sure if I remember it right, but there was a chemical in the body called, or in the brain, I believe, called tetrahydroxyisoquinine, which is a chemical that most people who have addiction don't have. And it's the chemical that creates a lot of bonding and a lot of connection and you get it in community. And I think being in a state of being in a community, being around a lot of people that I could relate to, that I felt safe with, really started to make me feel more normalized. Um, but I've also had a real signal on, I mean, a real um, emphasis on mind body science. And that's been something that's been really important for me. Even when I was having that issue, I used to ditch school in high school to go read mind body science because it was so fascinating how the mind affected the body. So even though I was dealing with this stuff, I still had that focus going on. And then over the years, you say you slowly kind of detach from your addictive tendencies towards other things, dairy products, and also uh, other food items, and also the way you deal with relationships. Uh, talk a little bit about that. What brought that on? Well, about 12 or 13 years ago, I had a real um, a really intense spiritual awakening. I was getting uh, in the process of getting divorced uh, from a man that I still love and adore, but we're not together anymore. And um, so I, and I was really dealing with the narcolepsy. I didn't know I had it. Um, I it was undiagnosed and the pain in my body. And I was really depressed and anxiety and panic and all this stuff. And then I ended up having um, an awakening where I realized that and this actually came because my ex-husband, when we were together, I was in the car with him and I was falling asleep, which is what narcolepsy is, where you fall asleep a lot. And he was screaming, he goes, you always fall asleep when you're doing, when you're not doing something that you want to do. You, you never fall asleep when you're doing something fun. And so that kind of actually was, a, a, it came to me now, that was maybe a couple of years before I realized that he was actually right. And when I was doing something that I really wanted to do, when I was doing something that felt good or that was fun or that was connecting, I saw my energy go up and I started to focus on things that I appreciate, people that I appreciate, all that stuff. I focused on it to such a degree that my pain went away, my energy increased and my health started to come back significantly and all the panic attacks went away and everything changed. But it started with really recognizing, oh, there's a difference in my energy when I'm doing something that I really like, that's wholesome fun. I'm not talking about destructive fun, but the kind of fun that is, you know, like exercising. And I have this weird ball that bounces weird, and it helps with agility. And that's fun, you know. So those kinds of things that were fun and being with people that I liked, it all started to raise my energy and it helped me feel connected to my spirit. I'd had lots of spiritual experiences before, but at that point I became committed on a deeper level to my spirit. There's a, I remember this actually was funny because I had this um, obsessive mind, you know, and the mind would obsess on what somebody had done that was wrong or what somebody had hurt me with. And I heard my spirit because I had said, how do I, how do I clear this? And this was like 13 years ago, my spirit said, harness the vehicle of obsession. Most people use it to their destruction, but you can use it for your benefit. And I said, what does that mean? They said, focus on something that feels good. And they, the feeling I got was the word japa, which is a Sanskrit word, I think, which means the repetition of a sacred name or phrase. And I started to focus on, thank you, God, I love you, God, just as I walked. And the 
obsession in my brain became an obsession of thankfulness. So this is very interesting, Karen, because all the literature suggests right now that recovery from addiction is uh, very rare, as you know, a very small percentage of people have uh, experienced this kind of freedom that you now have. And one of the reasons that's, uh, that's uh, probably why that's true is that memory, what we call memory is not in the brain. Memory is in consciousness. And of course, it corresponds to activity in the brain, but the actual memory is not in the brain, it's in consciousness, therefore it cannot be erased. No memory can be erased, conscious or subconscious, but it can be overshadowed by creating new memories, which is what you did. You created new memories of joy, of exhilaration, of, uh, I would say, moving from spirits to spirit in a way, metaphorically. Uh, and, and even though the memory hasn't gone away, it does not surface anymore because you have created new memories to anchor yourself in. And I love that phrase that you used, harnessing, in fact, the power of your obsessive tendencies. And that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So you have written a few books. Tell us about the books. Oh, you're so sweet. Well, the first book um, I wrote is called Chronic Pleasure. And I wrote that because I had been in so much pain and you endorsed it. And um, I really appreciate that. And um, this book helps people let go of pain and fatigue and have more energy. And the reason I wrote it is because I'd had an injury on my hand four years ago where the three tendons were severed and I didn't have any pain. I had such little pain that I was going to go bike riding and it was only because my neighbor walked by and he said, you have to go to the hospital. So I ended up needing a ton of, I needed surgery and lots of stitches and 10 months of physical therapy. I wrote Chronic Pleasure. Then this book is a memoir just because I'm an actress and I've done tons of stuff and people wanted to know about my life. And so you're in this book, by the way, um, of how I met you and the synchronicities there. And the third book is called Chronic Pleasure in Relationships, Inspire the Best in Men. And um, the, when you had asked about relationships, all my relationships have shifted to relationships of appreciation. I used to look at what somebody had done that was wrong and it would just play. That's what caused that prayer about how do I get out of this obsession, you know, harness that vehicle of, of, of obsession in a positive way. And as I had been focused in this negative way, I always saw what somebody was doing wrong or what somebody, how they were hurting me. And then when I got that understanding about using Japa in that way, all my relationships started to change. And I practiced looking at every single relationship. What were the gifts? What were the things that were really fun? And I saw it about my mom, my dad, my ex-husband, um, everybody in my life, all the relationships changed because I literally started focusing on just what I loved about them, all the wonderful things we'd experienced, all the sweetness in the relationships. And now I have only harmony in my relationships. It's just amazing. So this is very inspiring. All those books are very inspiring and you're helping a lot of people right now. But I think what you've given insight today is very, very um, important, what you've given insight to, whatever the addiction is, whether it's what other people did to you or how you might have been, in some people's mind, abused or taken advantage of, you actually discovered in those adversities the seed for what would be called liberation or freedom. What's your hope other people can learn from your experience and your books? Uh, if there were one or two or three takeaways, what would those be? Because these are very rare insights, what you've shared, and it's not common. First of all, what do you think of the usual 12-step recovery programs, etc.? that say, once you're an addict, you're an addict forever? You know, I've always thought about uh, addiction being the memory of pleasure which is now painful 
So, you know, the memory of pleasure overrides the pain you experience, even as you're using the substance that yeah. brought you pressure in the past. Would you agree with that? Yes, but it's a negative pleasure, I would say, because there's a positive pleasure that comes from appreciating people, from love, from smelling good flowers, you know. Uh, one of the things that I would love to share with people, I'm a, my mom is Greek and I love etymology just because she's Greek. And so that's all she taught me, a lot of etymology. But one of the things that I've learned is that the word addict means ad, uh, comes from the Latin root adicere. So the word addict is actually means to, and dict is part of dicere, which is to say, or like diction, to say, to say. So what you think about what a lot of people who have addictions are saying to themselves, what we grow up saying are, you know, I'm not good enough. Nobody loves me. Nobody understands me. Nobody cares. I'm stupid. I get everything wrong. I don't know how to do things. I'm, 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 I'm always, I'm never going to make it. I'm, I'm a failure. Uh, people don't see me. People don't get me. Nobody gets me. Nobody loves me. You know, all this stuff. I'm not safe. Life is scary. The world doesn't like me. I should die. That kind of thinking is what is, I believe, a big basis of addiction, what you're saying to yourself. So what I would suggest to anybody who's listening is if you could start to talk to yourself in a kind way, in a supportive way, you are good enough, you are important, you are beautiful, you are valuable, you are worthy, you are deserving of everything you want, you are precious you are someone that's easy to love you're lovable you're good enough and i would start to practice telling yourself those kinds of things so to say to yourself ad decere addict to say to yourself things like that so that you could start to shift the way that you think and when you think in a way where you do feel wanted, where you do feel valuable, where you do feel loved, you shift yourself from the addictive mind where you're looking for something outside of yourself to that mind where you have freedom, where you're safe, where you feel connected. Uh, before we close, can we just show your books again to our audience? And where can people get them from? Yeah, my books again. This is uh, the first book, Chronic Pleasure. This is the second book, Effortless Enchantment. And this is the third book, Chronic Pleasure in Relationships. And they're available everywhere that books are sold, but you can get them for free at chronicpleasurebook.com. Chronicpleasurebook.com. Well, that's very useful to, for our audience to know. I'm sure they'll buy them as well, but they can also take advantage of your free offer. I'm very grateful, Karen, uh, to you. 